Good day and welcome to the GEO Institute's fourth annual live streaming web conference. Today's topic will be embankments, dams and slopes, and the program facilitator is Navid Jafari. This is an audio web conference and you will hear the presentation through your computer speakers, and there will be a PowerPoint presentation that will be shown throughout the meeting. You can ask a question through the online web conference tool at any point during the session by clicking on the Ask Question button on the left of your screen. Type in your question into the box and hit the Send button to submit your question. I'd now like to turn the floor over to today's facilitator, Navid Jafari. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our um, fourth web conference on embankments, dams, and slopes. These three web conferences were organized and being presented by members of the EDS Committee of the Geo Institute. I would, like, I would like to acknowledge our gold sponsor for this conference is Keller. Uh, the companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide, including all services in one contract. Keller reduces client risk and ensures all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. We are grateful for Keller's support. I would like to now introduce all the speakers for today's session. The first presentation will be by Dr. Thomas Oman. He's an associate professor at Michigan Tech. He is the director of computational science and engineering. His presentation will be on remote sensing for slopes and embankments. The next presentation will be by Dr. Nevin Matasevich and Alan Whithoft. Uh, Dr. Matasevich is the Director of Geotechnical Engineering at Geologic Associates. Uh, Nevin and Alan's presentation will be mitigation of a fast-moving landslide with directional drilling. The third presentation will be by Jay McElvey. He is the Director, Geotechnical Design Division for Earth Engineering Incorporated. And his presentation title is Reinforced Slopes and Structures. And the final presentation is by Ada Zekos from the University of Michigan and soon to be the University of California, Berkeley. She's an associate professor and graduate chair currently at University of Michigan. Her presentation is Performance of Levies, Learning from the Past, Looking to the Future. With that, I'm going to move quickly to the first presentation by Dr. Oman. And I will hand off to Dr. Oman here. Thank you, Navid. And uh, good morning, everyone. And my presentation um, is titled Remote Sensing for Slopes and Embankments. So, Performance monitoring is a critical part of geotechnical engineering as we design with naturally occurring heterogeneous material. We deal with higher uncertainty in the numerical values of geotechnical properties, and urbanization is leading to the development of areas that are previously considered geologically unstable. Moreover, we need performance monitoring to evaluate design judgment and make any necessary design updates. So performance monitoring is a critical part of geotechnical engineering. Let me show you some um, figures of the landslide hazards within US. So what we have, a figure on the left uh, shows an overlay of the high landslide hazard zonation from the USGS on the population density map of the 48 US states. And you can see from this map that several urban centers are highly vulnerable to landslide hazards in US. The, the figure on the right top corner is a comparison of the landslide hazard to the road network in the US. And you can see similarly, there is a lot of road network that's vulnerable to landslide hazards in US. 
On the lower right-hand corner is the map that shows the location for 8,100 8, major dams in the United States. And if you overlay the landslide hazard, again, you can see it is critical that we do performance monitoring because there is a lot of dams that are vulnerable to landslide hazards. In addition to that, the aging infrastructure and increase of extreme rainfall all highlight the significance of performance monitoring. Traditionally, performance monitoring has been done using in-situ instrumentation. But in recent years, the, the remote sensing techniques have shown great promise in being used for, to, to be used for performance monitoring. These remote sensing techniques include uh, INSAR, which stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, LIDAR, Photogrammetry, Thermal Imaging, Hyperspectral Imaging. And these different remote sensing techniques can be done from various platforms, including satellite platforms, aerial platforms, manned or unmanned aerial platforms, terrestrial or stationary or mobile platforms. In this presentation, I will be showing two case studies that demonstrate the applicability of INSAR from satellite platform for, for performance monitoring. The first case study is the performance monitoring of slopes, and the second case study is on monitoring dams. Let me begin with some basics on the on INSAR. So INSAR utilizes synthetic aperture radar, which works by illuminating the Earth with a beam of coherent microwave radiation. The, the, ra the wavelength of that radiation is ranges from X band, which is about three centimeter, to L band which is about 24 centimeter. From two different synthetic aperture radar data, you can actually monitor the change in deformation that is occurring on the ground. And with the synthetic aperture radar, you have two measurements that you get. One is the amplitude, and the other is the phase. The phase measurement is the one that is used for interferometry um, or in, in SAR. So the unit of length used in INSAR is the wavelength and Although the satellite measurements are made from 800 kilometers away from the Earth, the phase change is a function of the wavelength. And since the wavelength measurements are in centimeter scale, the deformations can be measured from millimeter to centimeter accuracy. So you can actually make very accurate measurements from 800 kilometers away. Let me show you a case study on the slopes that I mentioned. The first case study is from, from a slope failure in Nevada along a rail corridor. The, the, site, site, the site had experienced some slope movements in December 2005. And in February 2006, there were some rotational slope motions observed. And in May 2011, a massive rock slide began. And you can see the picture of that uh, very next to the uh, in a critical rail corridor. And from 2011, the company has been doing detailed ground monitoring at the site. They, were, they asked us to see if remote sensing techniques can be used to monitor the slope. The 
first step was to look for the data sets. And what we found was we had data from 1992 from the ERS satellite, and the ERS satellite was functional till 2000. And from 2003, the NBSAT satellite, which had the, exactly the same configuration as the ERS, was available. And that data was available till 2010. So we combined the data sets from 1992 to 2010 to make um, a remote sensing observation at the site to see whether we can measure ground displacements. We used the method of stacking, and two different approaches were used, the persistent scatter interferometry and the distributed scatter interferometry. What I am showing here is the points that we got from our um, INSAR measurement, so these red, yellow points that we have overlaid on the, the, the terrain model shows the, the, the displacements that have been measured. And the three displacements right at the, where the failure occurred, uh, the three red points circled, are shown in a plot below. I'm sorry that the the x-axis are really small, but the x-axis goes all the way from 1992, when we had the first data set, all the way to 2010. And you can see that um, the, the displacements were close to zero till 2005. And in 2005 is when the displacement, uh, the slope started experiencing displacement. And in 2010, is the major failure occurred. So between 2005 to 2010, there were about 60 millimeters of movement. So um, roughly more than, uh, a little over two inches of movement happened in that five years. And the, the question that we had was, why the slope started moving all of a sudden in 2005 when it was, com when it was completely stable from 1992. So in order to answer that question, we started looking um, uh, into the literature to see whether there were any seismic activity or any, any, uh, any major event in that area. And what we found was that there was a time-stamped um, uh, photograph from that region that showed that there was a major flooding event in that region. And this flooding even caused several trains to derail, and uh, the track was um, eroded. The base of the track was eroded. And in order to fix the track back, the, there was some blasting done at the site. And some of this, the, the slope toll was blasted. And this triggered the, the slope movement. So this was a nice case study that showed us that we could detect the movement right when it started. Not only we could detect, it, it does give us some early warning. The, fa the major failure only occurred in 2010. And up before the major failure, there was about 60 millimeters of movement that we could have detected and actually uh, prevented that major failure to happen. Now, the question was, this site, there was already a failure happened, can we do this more proactively? And in order to do that, we looked at the entire, uh, we looked at a larger uh, corridor along the, uh, the rail line, and we identified several other locations that had ground movements happening. And we reported this to the company, and you can see some of the sites we have photographs. Uh, some of the uh, unstable sites uh, we reported to the company. And in fact, this is the site where the major failure occurred. You can see some of the stable sites that uh, did not pick up in the INSAR. This is another stable site. And based on our recommendation, the company did make uh, some, do some mitigation measures, which you can actually see here. So the INSAR 
uh, approach could be not only used for um, forensic studies where you can actually go back and investigate because there is historic archive of the data, but you can also do proactive monitoring and may, uh, do mitigation based on those proactive recommendations. Let me move to the next case study that I have. So the next case study that I have is from the Casitas Dam in California. The Casitas Dam is located in the Ventura County, um, about 100 miles northwest of Los Angeles. And it was built as part of the Ventura River Project Authorization Bill in 1955. The proposed reservoir uh, would distribute water for agriculture, municipal, and industrial use through a 33-mile pipeline. And the construction happened from 1956 to 59. The dam is currently operated by the U.S. Bureau of uh, Reclamation and is part of Lake Casitas. The specifications of the dam, the crest length is about 610 meter, the crest elevation is about 178 meter, uh, the spillway crest elevation is about 173 meter, the structural height is 102 meter, and you can see that there is a berm that is being built next to the dam crest, and this berm was not part of the original construction. The berm was constructed in 1909-2000 time period and the height of the berm is about 40 meters, so it's a significant uh, berm. Now, the, uh, the, there is an article from Los Angeles Times that I want to show here. The, uh, there was concern that if there is some size activity in the area, that the dam could liquefy and cause a failure and could endanger um, communities downstream and um, have huge um, uh, impact. And therefore, the, the recommendation by the federal government was to build this berm. And the berm was initially budgeted for $20 million, and when it was finished in 2000, it cost about $42 million. We used, in this case, um, a satellite uh, data from NVSAT, uh, 23 NVSAT ASAR images we used. The NVSAT was, is a European Space Agency satellite that was operational from 2002 to 2012, and the data set that we used was from 2005 to 2010. The spatial resolution of this was about 20 meter, and the wavelength is 5.6 centimeter, which is a C band. And uh, the data sets that we were used were the descending orbit one. So here is um, the points that we got. Um, <coughs> the legend shows the average velocity. Uh, negative velocities show settlement. Um, positive velocities show uplift towards the satellite. So you can see that um, along um, the crust, there are a lot of uh, settlements occurring, and um, somewhere down um, in the um, near the power plant or the pumping station, there is actually some uplift occurring. Um, now, the, I want to particularly t bring uh, your attention to these four points that we have highlighted. So one two, three, and four. So I'll show you a time um, plot of the displacements occurring at those locations. So here is the, um, the time plot of the displacements. And you can see here that at location two, the displacement is about 45 millimeter over that five-year time period from 2005 to 2010. At location four, which is this yellow color, you can see that there is almost no displacement. It's negligible. So this area is pretty stable, whereas area close to two is experiencing much higher displacement. 
Now, locations one and three, you can see that there is some displacement occurring there, but it is considerably small considered, uh, considering with uh, location two. Uh, it is about, uh, about 50, uh, 20 millimeters in that five-year period. Now, we did, um, since the points were sparse, we wanted to see the, the bigger trend of movement at the site. So we did a spatial interpolation using rigging and to find the displacement, uh, the, the spatial distribution of the displacement rates. And I would actually show you a few of the animations from those rigging. You can see that this is from 2005 initially. You can see some uh, larger displacements occurring at that location where the two was and also closer to the pumping station. Um, and you would see as time progresses, 2006, those in a displacements are uh, adding up. Um, here what we are showing is the cumulative displacement. So 2006 now. 2008, by 2008, the uh, displacements have significantly increased. And further, 2008, eight month. And you can clearly see that there is movements happening at the berm uh, and the dam at that location close to that two in 2009. And 2009 further, and you can see here this 2010, the first month, and you can see the maximum displacement um, is occurring close to that uh, the berm, the foot of the berm. Now this is a uh, contouring of that, and you can see that the maximum displacement at the crest was about 22 millimeter, and the maximum displacement at the berm was about 32 millimeter. We looked at uh, the, uh, the crust uh, with Google Earth images, and what we could see is that there are visible uh, damages at the berm, uh, at the crust, that we can see. What uh, that is a, a correspond that uh, the visible damages actually match well with the areas where that maximum displacement is observed on the crust. Whereas in the case of the berm, um, we could not actually find any visible damages, but the, the displacements that were occurring at the berm were actually greater than what was observed at the crust. Now, the, the engineering guideline for uh, monitoring embankments uh, recommend that um, dams be monitored for surface settlement, uh, surface alignment, foundation movement, and uh, the embankments for existing embankments and dams, settlement of the crust, or bulging of the uh, slopes might indicate developing problems. And So uh, they recommend short-term and long-term monitoring of dams um, using survey control points. But what we are seeing is that with INSAR, you can actually achieve that. Um, and you can also get a much uh, better spatial distribution and coverage, whereas the survey points are limited to one location. So for example, in this case study, if your survey location was close to that point four, you would have seen that it, the dam is uh, not experiencing that much movement. Whereas uh, the two or three, if it was uh, at the locations of uh, one or three, again, the movements would have been very minimal. But the location two was the one that was experiencing the most mo mo movement. So the, the INSAR actually provides you a better spatial coverage compared to the traditional approaches. Um, um, Final concluding thoughts from me. Um,
for INSAR um, in terms of performance monitoring. The INSAR provides a rich data archive for forensic investigation. Um, it provides millimeter scale movements that can be observed from satellite pr uh, platform using stack stacking techniques. Uh, it provides an opportunity to proactively monitor infrastructure and improved spatial and temporal resolution is, uh, can be obtained. So temporally, also these satellites nowadays, you can actually get data every 14 um, days. So every two weeks, you can actually make an observation. Finally, I want to show you this uh, new NASA mission that is coming up that's going to be launching in December 2021 called the NISAR mission, which is a joint mission between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization, which will have both S and L band SAR data sets. Um, we have been relying on the European agency for uh, radar data for a long time. So this is going to be an exciting time for um, U.S. researchers to use U.S. radar data to, um, to monitor infrastructure and for performance monitoring. So that's going to be very exciting. And this is going to have full global coverage. With that, um, I would like to take any questions. Thank you, Thomas, for that excellent presentation. Um, I will check to see if there's any questions at the moment. Uh, there is one by Pablo. Um, the question is, is the SAR data publicly available? Um, uh, yes, uh, some data sets. Some data sets you need to actually pay. Uh, some are available for free. Um, there are several satellite agencies that provide data sets uh, for researchers for free. So it depends which uh, data set you're trying to use. Excellent. Hopefully that helped. Um, I do have one question as we transition, Thomas. Um, the areas you showed, California and Nevada, are dry in areas such as Louisiana and I'd say the, the Midwest and going towards the east and even the northwest where there's a lot of forest and vegetation. Does INSAR still work? Um, uh, that's an excellent question, Naveed. Um, um, it depends which uh, wavelength that you're using. If you're using actually uh, higher wavelengths, it would work, uh, but shorter wavelengths may not because of the vegetation and um, the, that could create lack of coherence, but uh, the higher wavelengths will work. Um, you can also do some corrections for some of that uh, using uh, vegetation models um, and atmospheric models. Um, that can be utilized to refine your data. So there are possibilities, but certainly a vegetation is a challenge. It, pro it, it brings a challenge. Gotcha. Thank you, Dr. Oman. Excellent. So now we're going to move to the second presentation by Dr. Nevin Matasevich and Alan Withoff. I will leave the floor to Nevin. Thank you, Navid. So I will, actually Alan and I will talk about, uh, well, a pretty big landslide, a landslide which is moving very fast and it's moving a lot. So the landslide that Navid showed move inch or two a year. Well, this one moves up to 11 feet a year. So let's see. So to properly understand this landslide, to be able to deal with the state, uh, to be able to uh, develop in, uh, objectives, how to mitigate this light, and then to come with a mitigation approach, well, there's some background that needs to be explained. So here is my favorite view of Southern California. The vertical scale is exaggregated, but it shows where is the site, where is the landslide in relation to downtown Los Angeles, which is about 23 miles north, uh, <coughs> north uh, east, with relation to uh, Los Angeles International Airport and my favorite site, you know, Disneyland. Uh, 
the site is called Portuguese Land Landslides. It's actually a landslide complex. It's uh, you know, several landslides nested, you know, one on top of each other. We will talk only a one about one which is on top and which is moving fast and which is moving a lot. Uh, the movement was noticed a long time ago, 60-something years ago, at least in 1956, and has been going on and on uh, over time. And the uh, last couple of years, we have actually pretty good data to document how much it is moving and how fast it is moving. Uh, here's a more closer view of the slide. You know, the slide is uh, delineated by magenta outline. It is about 240 acres, so you know, about 38 million cubic yards. So for those who think metric, it's about kilometer by kilometer. Uh, it's not just a landslide because there is a major road, actually, major important road on top of this landslide. Uh, called Palos Verdes Drive South, PVDS. And uh, there is a main sewer line also on top of it, parallel to the road. And that sewer line, well, if it breaks, about 12,000 people will, well, uh, remain without sewer for who knows how long. So there is a significant cost to maintain, you know, well, such a large movement in use uh, along the road and the sewer, you know, just to give you an idea about just for the road, about $640,000 a year and about half a million just to maintain the sewer line. So the, on this next slide, what we can see is a little bit more detailed information about how slide is moving. Uh, we again have uh, an outline, this time with a black line of the landslide. The road is also shown with a black line. And then we have displacement vectors, and they are color coded. And they are color coded with the red being the, the largest movement. This is what I keep referring to, you know, up to 11 feet. And then as we move from red to orange to magenta and green, you know, displacements or movements changes to, you know, in some areas, you know, as little as 0.1 foot per year. Now, since this movement started long time ago, there are many studies and many reports. Actually, uh, last time I checked, we have about 585 reports about this site on file. And uh, most of them are geology studies. And I really don't recall reading any of those geology studies which did not conclude with, uh, well, we need more data or we need more investigation. Well, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, time has come to, well, put all of this together and somebody says, well, no more investigation. Somebody needs to figure out what to do with this and what's the best way to stabilize this, develop design, and proceed with that. And uh, that is what we did. Now, this slide is kind of a cartoon uh, it's a schematics which summarizes all these 585 reports and basically identifies main causes of this landsliding. And those can be grouped into four main areas. Uh, number one, labeled here, the number one is essentially artesian pressure. There is a pressure below the phage surface. And there is a well pronounced phage surface because there are bentonite beds in this formation. And as landslide moves, it basically shears and pulverizes material along the failure plane, and that also becomes a pretty effective hydraulic barrier. And if that continues for some time, you know, there is a well pronounced and effective hydraulic barrier. Those bentonite beds, you know, also don't help. And bentonite beds are relatively thin, but they are also very uh, impervious and that complicates the situation. There is also a purged groundwater about the slip surface, and that also is partially cause, uh, causing landsliding, even though we think it's secondary. And then, of course, coastal erosion at the toe doesn't help. And notice that the toe of this landslide actually is in the ocean, so you can't see it from the surface. You have to dive to see it. Uh, 
here are a few slides to illustrate how this looks like. So here's, here's the road that, well, you know, just this slide tells you all. You know, it has to be fixed. It's fixed constantly. See the patch on top of the patch. See unsafe traffic conditions. Uh, uh, see discharge, uh, disconnected drainage lines. The drainage needs to be fixed all the time. Here's my sewer line, actually two sewer lines, which, you know, force main, which need constant maintenance. And then, you know, while you make repairs, well, you know, that also creates some unsafe traffic conditions. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. So the road is now, well, about 100 feet outside of its right of way. So, so it's uh, still moving. So that also creates some problems. And those problems are relevant because, uh, you know, as you will see later, you know, somebody, you know, needs to, you know, convince everybody what needs to be done and then get permits and then proceed with design and construction. Uh, I will conclude uh, this overview of the background with this slide which shows, you know, you cracks. There are also cracks all around this main slide complex and beyond and we believe this is the source of infiltration source of you know in some locations artesian pressure and in some location you know purge groundwater conditions uh, those cracks you know it's not do not affect only groundwater recharge it also emergency vehicles access uh, safety you know uh, at the site and in the vicinity and so on so uh, Knowing all of this, processing the data, having meetings with various stakeholders, uh, the way to proceed is to define the project objectives and then have everybody involved, you know, accept those project objectives. So uh, let's see what we established. Well, you know, first of all, uh, one needs to consider site constraints. And, uh, there are many. Uh, some of them are pretty significant. Like, for example, most of these sites, as shown here by orange, is a habitat, it's restricted habitat. And when you have restricted habitat, especially in Southern California, well, it's very difficult to do anything. There is no bug and bunny that is worth sacrificing. So uh, there are many stakeholders which uh, uh, would like and see the value of a solution of mitigating the landslide, but really don't want to grant you access or to let you do anything, you know, anything invasive, you know, even, you know, even driving on top of this. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis here is certainly important, and that was a driving factor here because the cost of maintaining the road and the sewer line is, you know, pretty steep. Uh, and then there is a beach at the top of this landslide, and you know most of this beach is a private beach, a private access beach, and you have to pay a membership to access to, to get to the beach. So they are also not that happy with any kind of uh, intervention into the site. So it's really what one can do is limited. You know, it's limited not only what you can do, but also with the fast moving of this landslide, you can't drill. You know, and install vertical wells because they get sheared pretty sheared off pretty soon. So, what can we do? Well, given the constraints, here's what we came up with. That is, minimize the site's footprint, so limit, you know, you know, the remedial measures to the fastest portion of the site. So let's first fix this one first, and then uh, see how that affects the rest of the site. Uh, we, it's pretty obvious to everybody, but difficult to convince all the stakeholders that one cannot stop such a landslide. All what can be done is to reduce the displacement rate and reduce the maintenance costs. So reduce, not fix, once for all. There were a couple of attempts in the past, and all of them failed. Uh, important consideration is uh, reduction of the likelihood extent of the catastrophic failure. As I mentioned before, landslide fails, sewer line fails. There is lots of sewage in the ocean, and that's a big issue. And then, of course. There is a cost. This is one of the few cities in Southern California which actually has a surface, but the cost is still an issue. 
So here is a summary of design objectives. Uh, I'll you know, first deal with what affects movement of this slide the most, and this is this artesian pressure, what we call here confined water, uh, <coughs> water below, uh, below the slip surface. And then as a secondary measure, try to control infiltration and through that, try to control both, you know, artesian pressure and perched water above the slip surface. Uh, bentonite beds, they are, they are all over, but we can't do much about them, and we certainly can't do anything with respect to the erosion at the toe. And with that, I will let my colleague Alan Withoff to explain, you know, technical details, what we plan to do, what we did, what is left to do, and with that, Alan. You go. Oh, thank you, Nevin. So uh, we are taking sort of a, a two-pronged approach to this project. Uh, first of all, uh, based on preliminary uh, uh, analysis and talking with uh, local experts, uh, we, are, we are fairly confident that the uh, artesian pressure at the toe of the slide is a, is a major driver. Uh, so first phase of the implementation, we want to uh, get at the artesian pressure and relieve that. Uh, as a secondary uh, follow-up measure, we also want to cut off, to the extent we can, uh, the recharge of the perched uh, groundwater from uh, ponded surface uh, stormwater. So I'm most, mostly focusing here on the, on the first point. So key idea here, uh, how we get at the uh, confined water and relieve the artesian pressure is to have long horizontal or directional drains uh, below the basal rupture surface. Uh, a more conventional dewatering approach might be to put in, uh, as Nevin mentioned, uh, vertical dewatering wells. Uh, but if you're going to get at the, the artesian water below the slip surface, you have to penetrate with the vertical wells through the slip surface. And that, uh, that uh, for such a fast-moving slide, results in the, the wells shearing off almost immediately after you install them. So that's no good. Uh, also, given the, the formation here, which is uh, uh, bentonite bearing, um, we, we're expecting uh, an exceptionally low uh, hydraulic conductivity. So the, the mode of um, uh, water flow we expect to be through fractures mostly. So if you have vertical wells, you're likely to miss those fractures. Uh, with the long horizontal well, you have a much greater chance of, of penetrating fractures and actually producing some water. We're proposing in the, in the design uh, six arrays of horizontal drains, uh, five drains apiece, uh, arranged in sort of a fan shape, um, uh, extending out from, a, from a, uh, an initial point where you have your, your uh, drilling rig set up. Uh, so we have two general categories of uh, drains, the first and the uh, uh, the first is what we're calling sort of relief drains. Uh, that are these uh, three arrays at the toe of the slide, and those have the most uh, immediate impact uh, to, to get at the artesian uh, pressure and relieve that right away. Uh, secondarily, we have upslope, what we're calling interceptor-type uh, drains, and those have a longer-term outlook. Uh, the idea there is to cut off recharge uh, coming from upslope. So uh, notice also a key point is that uh, um, uh, five of six of these arrays are designed to be gravity flow, which simplifies things a lot. You don't have to worry about electrical uh, components, you know, clogged pumps and all that sort of thing. Okay, for the for the four downslope uh, arrays, uh, we're planning uh, for these to be directionally drilled. Uh, the 
the idea is to dive down uh, as fast as possible below the failure surface and then run out uh, as far as possible uh, to get as much collection as we can. Uh, these will be a blind installation, so we're capped out at the length about 1,200 feet uh, with a fairly small diameter drain. Uh, the two upslope uh, arrays will be horizontally drilled, which is a more conventional uh, installation. Uh, should be much cheaper, uh, easier access, and also has the advantage of not using uh, drilling mud and, and requiring disposal of that. Also, I, as an aside, I want to just point out briefly that uh, uh, the sort of innovative uh, surface water management uh, aspects here. Um, given the, given the uh, fast moving landslide and all the deformation uh, we expect, we, we really need uh, something that's deformation tolerant that can handle a lot of water. So we, uh, after some back and forth with the city and the public, uh, city council, we, we settled on a geocell-lined uh, engineered swale system and a GCL-lined detention basin for temporary uh, storage. So I'll tell you a little bit about our, our design and analysis approach here. So we have a lot of information. Um, so first step is to organize all that information into a, a coherent uh, framework and then develop a 3D model of the site. Uh, then the, a key aspect of the analysis is the shear strength of the basal rupture surface below the slide. And again, we want to, to fit that shear strength into our coherent picture of the site. So uh, we figured the best way to do that is a back analysis uh, approach. Uh, We've got a lot of considerations, that, so it's not a purely technical exercise to develop the drainage, uh, uh, the drain locations. So that's sort of a separate step. We, we set, settle on those, and then last we uh, look at what's the effect of those drains on uh, uh, groundwater conditions and ultimately on the uh, slope stability. So as, uh, as Nevin mentioned, we have something like 585 uh, reports, papers, and so on uh, about the site. And uh, at this point, the, the city is, is more or less fed up, and they said no more investigation. Uh, so fortunately, uh, a lot of previous consultants since the late 50s have uh, pretty much Swiss cheese the, the east part of the site. Uh, so we have a lot of information uh, to work with, but you know there are some data gaps. Uh, for example, on the on the west side, there hasn't been a lot of investigation, uh, and also, of course, with uh, hundreds of feet of movement, um, the boring locations have all moved. So aside from the the uh, topo at the ground surface, uh, these are the two uh, key items, uh, uh, elevation contours of basal rupture surface and uh, groundwater table are, are shown here. Uh, these are mostly pieced together from previous plans and section views uh, with, with some modifications. Uh, for example, daylighting around the edges of the uh, of basal rupture surface. Uh, groundwater table is more straightforward but with some extrapolation. Uh, uh, important point here is uh, the shaded uh, blue areas uh, on the groundwater map, uh, these are areas where artesian or, or uh, confined uh, groundwater conditions have been reported in the past, so that, that sort of supports our postulated uh, uh, mechanism. So key assumption in back analysis is always what is the factor of safety of the existing uh, configuration? Uh, for a typical landslide, it's, it's fairly safe to say that uh, uh, 1.0 factor of safety uh, is, the existing uh, uh, is existing for something that goes all at once. Uh, but how about for Portuguese Bend landslide, which has been uh, creeping for 60 years or more? 
so what, what we're suggesting here is that uh, um, factor safety for back analysis is more likely in the range of one to one and a quarter, uh, which corresponds to roughly 80 to 100 percent of the, the shear strength mobilized, uh, which is more in line with a, a creep-like mechanism than a, a catastrophic mechanism. Now we know from the GPS survey data that the different parts of the landslide are moving at different rates. So for our back analysis, we're isolating uh, seaward, central, and landward segments of the slip surface, and uh, we assign different factors of safety uh, as, the, as the slip surface goes higher up the slope. So the slower movement uh, of different parts of the slide correspond to higher factor of safety. And then we can evaluate the friction angle for the different segments. So moving from back analysis uh, to forward analysis, we used our, our uh, CAD model to develop a 3D uh, slope stability and seepage model of the site uh, using the Soil Vision uh, uh, software suite. Uh, modeling is a two-step process. Uh, the first step, we're using a finite element-based uh, uh, SV flux to generate a pore pressure distribution. And then we import that to look at uh, into SV slope to look at the slope stability. Hmm. So as with most uh, finite element problems, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, different approaches for incorporating our drain arrays in the seepage model. Uh, suppose you could say the most obvious is that in the top pane, as we're showing, is to model each drain individually. Uh, which SB flux allows you to do. Um, it's, it's less efficient, you have a dense finite element mesh, and, and it's more computationally intensive. So we, we eventually moved away from this approach uh, to the, toward the lower pane. Uh, you, have, you can sort of smear out the effect of the arrays over an area. Uh, here we're showing circles, but the arbitrary ge geometry can be used. So once we have a pore pressure distribution, we can import that into the slope stability model. Uh, this figure is showing the output from the slope stability, uh, which is a factor of safety map uh, before and after installation of the drains. And it takes some interpretation, but basically the effect of the drains is to reduce the area of the fastest movement, that's the red and pink areas. Uh, and, uh, and also to push that area south of the road and the force main, so toward the ocean. Uh, so this is a good sign from a maintenance standpoint. You have less frequent maintenance if you have slower movement. Uh, but also the volume involved in a catastrophic failure would be much smaller and uh, most likely wouldn't take the, the road and the sewer line for a ride. So it's not a perfect outcome, but it's the best you can hope for given the, the site constraints. So where is the project now and where are we going with this? Well, we submitted a preliminary permit level uh, set of drawings and an uh, accompanying design report to the city uh, last month. Uh, we're currently waiting for city council approval of the design. And uh, once we get that, then uh, we'll move ahead to the permitting stage. So everyone's happy for now. And with that, we'll conclude and uh, open up for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Nevin and Alan, for that excellent presentation on landslide mitigation. Um, I am checking to see if there's any questions or answers. There are currently, um, as I check them, question for Nevin and Alan is, I saw in your schematic um, you had artesian pressure, you had the effects of the ocean. That artesian pressure is a function of recharge from rainwater, not a, anything related to the ocean. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And do you have uh, plans when you install these drains to at least monitor how much flow is occurring to see based on your SV flux and slope stability analyses 
if they're performing as anticipated? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the plan. I mean, we'll install those drains in, well, you know, in sequences. You know, you don't install all of them at once. It will be, you know, one at a uh, do test, see what's coming out, put in the model, see what's the effect, adjust the model, adjust the layout. And uh, this is more or less typical. We have a site here in Southern California at which we have 1,200 foot long drains like this. And uh, it functions. Uh, we monitor, we measure, we collect what's coming out, we adjust the model. So this is not, you know, this, you know, there's a process technique experience already in place. This site is a little bit specific because it has significant environmental issues and, you know, many agencies involved. Like, get, you just give you, let me give you just a taste. Like, like what we expect to be, to come out of those drains is orange water because there's lots of iron in these formational materials. So groundwater is actually colored. And that doesn't look good at the beach. So we will need to collect, we will need to test, you know, depending how much it comes, we will need to develop a system for discharge. So lots of fun at this site. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's currently any further questions, but the uh, audience has an opportunity to email Nevin and Alan directly if they have any follow-up questions. With that, I will move to the third presentation. Thank you, Nevin and Alan, for the excellent presentation. The third presentation will be by Jay McElvey, and I'll uh, leave the floor for him. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jay McKelvey with Earth Engineering. Um, this presentation is going to be on reinforced slopes and structures, just basics uh, pertaining to the tools that we have in our toolbox uh, for the stability of slopes and structures. Uh, reinforced slopes and structures are uh, pretty much use either geosynthetics or metallic reinforcement to enhance the ability of the uh, soil or structure to remain stable at inclinations that would exceed the shear strength of the soil. So we're talking about taking our inclination steeper than uh, uh, what would be typical uh, two to uh, one and a half to one, uh, and we can go to uh, near vertical uh, depending on how we do our design. Uh, this is this technology is typically uh, referred to as mechanically stabilized earth. Uh, we can use this not only for new construction, but we can also uh, uh, use these techniques to remediate failed portions of slopes and walls. Uh, the geosynthetic reinforcement that we're considering is typically high, either higher strength geotextiles or geogrids. Metallic reinforcement can either be a planar mesh that you would see, like with the uh, Reinforced Earth Company's uh, uh, MSE walls, uh, or we can use soil nails or rock anchors. Uh, the design techniques are typically limit equilibrium. This slide here shows what's probably the most common type of reinforced earth uh, structure that we're seeing on the market now, primarily due to the, the cost effectiveness of this system. What you're seeing here is on the right are uh, segmental retaining walls uh, that are stabilized with the geogrid that you can see in the foreground. Uh, in the, in the background, you can see the contractor is starting to place the backfill on this, and this would basically continue vertical until the type of the wall uh, is uh, uh, the wall is completed. <clears throat> this one shows a completed wall. It, uh, this particular wall uh, goes from zero over towards the left and is approximately 25 foot tall. We don't have to go with just hard armor, man. Here is a reinforced slope, uh, and here uh, we're just using metallic baskets to use as a form to provide a near vertical face of the soil structure itself. And this could be vegetated and then made to look quite pleasing aesthetically. 
as far as metallic reinforcement, uh, I'm going to focus here on uh, cut walls. What we're shown here is the installation of soil nails. The bar size that we got here, 14 millimeter or 40 millimeter, that extend approximately 20 feet back into the uh, the soil face that you're seeing. So we're doing a vertical cut. We we drill in 15, 20 feet. Put these metallic bars in. Uh, that looks kind of like a number 14 rebar. Uh, we can then apply uh, a, uh, a shotcrete fascia on that after cover, uh, covering that with the uh, epoxy mesh that you're seeing. And then you're also shown in this photograph are strips of geocomposite that we use for drainage. Now, the fascia itself, you, this doesn't look particularly attractive even for a dirt guy like me. Uh, we can attach a segmental blocks uh, to our ground anchors here. In this particular project here, we're, we're looking at a 40-foot tall wall. We've got anchors that are coming out through the shot creep fascia that was used for a temporary consideration, and then that would be rigidly attached to the segmental blocks that you're seeing at the, at the front. And then the next slide shows the completed structure, and like I said, this one's 40 feet tall, and uh, ends up looking quite nice. Now, we're not stuck with just going with these segmental blocks. We had a project out here on the uh, East Coast. This is the Pocono Speedway. Uh, here are the, uh, a pair of tunnels underneath uh, the second turn started collapsing shortly after construction, and they were initially stabilized by internal bracing, which became quite a, a problem for the owner as far as getting traffic in and out because the vertical extent of the tunnels was significantly compromised. Uh, they got some money uh, from the, uh, the state to rehab that, so we actually uh, restored the, the tunnels using soil nails, and then on the fascia, what we did was we created either a soil nail wall uh, or a combination that's shown in this slide. So at the base of this wall, you can see a soil nail stabilized uh, uh, em embankment, and then above that is a geosynthetic reinforced uh, basket wall. And that once that was done, we covered that all with shotcrete and sculpted it to make it look like hewn rock. As shown here. So now you can see the completed tunnels, and it looks like this rock was just cut into the side of the embankment. So, how do we go about doing the design on these things? This next series of slides, I thank my dear friend Bob Kerner for providing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if you heard, but we lost Bob this week. So it seems kind of fitting that I get the look at his slides. Uh, Bob provided me these slides uh, when I was teaching the, uh, designing with geosynthetics class, and these are directly from his presentation. What's shown here is uh, in this particular slide, we are going to extend an existing highway shoulder approximately four and a half meters. Uh, by doing so, we're going to cut a temporary slope to the left side, and then Using geosynthetic reinforcement at regular spacing, we are going to provide a final embankment surface that's roughly one and a half to one, as you can see there. The primary reinforcement through analysis is typically about two foot uh, vertical. And then at the fascia, in order to keep the soils from raveling, uh, between the geograde reinforcement, we have secondary reinforcement. That's typically uh, either a biaxial geograd uh, or even higher strength turf reinforcement, and then that would be vegetated or perhaps backfilled with stone. The design of, uh, of this begins with developing the shear strength that we can use in the design for the geosynthetic reinforcement in this case. This equation here is basically we're going to take the ultimate strength of the material and we're going to divide it by a series of reduction factors 
uh, one being for installation damage, recognize we're going to be backfilling a plastic material with uh, soil or possibly rock, and that will, in fact, uh, induce damage. So the manufacturers provides this information uh, after testing, uh, uh, backfilling their material with various uh, uh, soils, and then they provide that installation damage reduction factor. The next parameter to the right in the denominator is a reduction factor for creep. Uh, the geosynthetics have a tendency of failing at uh, strengths uh, below their ultimate strength further down the road. So uh, in order to uh, uh, account for that, uh, significant testing is done to develop a creep safety factor which is provided uh, by the manufacturers for the design life of your structure. And then finally, last one is a reduction factor for durability. Back in the day, it used to be one for biological degradation and chemical degradation. Well, they found out that earthworms don't like to eat geosynthetics, so we don't consider that anymore. However, there are instances where we may have chemical interaction between the soil or the backfill material and the geosynthetic. In particular, uh, polyester, for example, doesn't like high pH environments, so uh, uh, we may have a reduction factor far greater than one to account for that. Polyethylene, on the other hand, is, is used for geogrid, and uh, that material is pretty much found to be inert to just about any chemical at room temperature, which is why we end up using it in landfills for containment of, of uh, hazardous materials. So uh, the ultimate strength is starts off by simply taking uh, a swatch of the fabric. Here is a wide width tensile test that's being done. Uh, we're placed between two, uh, uh, two tension grips, and it is pulled until it fails. So we're going to take that factor there and we're going to divide it by the, that series of reduction factors. Now Bob has this slide here that's right out of his textbook. Uh, the equation I was just showing was his equation 3-6. And here is a recommendation that Bob had for uh, installation damage creep in, uh, chemical biological damage uh, for various application areas. We're talking about roads and slopes. You can see the insulation damage is going to generally range from 1.1 to 1.4 uh, for uh, slopes and walls, and you can see the other values for uh, roadways and embankments. The higher values are going to be more aggressive uh, aggregate uh, uh, damaging that material, so we have to count for that. Creep factor shown here. This is pretty much independent of material properties. You'd have to go and reference the, the manufacturer's creep data uh, to uh, you have a successful design. And then finally, we got these uh, chemical and biological uh, uh, degradation uh, factors. And you can see they typically live somewhere around between 1 to 1.4. So we would take that factor. Uh, that ultimate strength and divide it by these recommended values. Again, I reference you to the manufacturer's uh, values because they're typically based off of uh, uh, institute testing. So how do we begin? Well, it, it's easy to get our arms wrapped around it when we kind of think about a wall. Uh, so in this slide here, we have a, a proposed wall that's uh, of a height H. And you can see that there is a failure plane that's oriented from the horizontal uh, of 45 plus phi over 2, where phi is the effective stress internal angle of friction. So for a typical value, let's say 30 degrees for, for the phi value, this uh, failure plane would be oriented at approximately 60 degrees from the horizontal. So any any material to the left of that plane is basically going to go for a ride. So what are we going to do? We're going to extend our reinforcement back sufficiently enough that we can and, uh, grip onto our reinforcement and uh, 
and provide a stable structure. So what you're looking at here is a series of reinforcement layers, basically, like I said, they're typically about two foot vertical. They extend out to the fascia, and in this, this particular case, the material is actually wrapped back uh, a sufficient distance to provide a fascia. Uh, we uh, call these walls uh, wrap back walls back in the day. Uh, they're not particularly attractive, and uh, they tend to look like a series of pillowcases stacked up on each other, which brought in those uh, metallic back, uh, baskets that I was showing you in the previous slide. But anyway, uh, to the right, we have basically a soil pressure uh, uh, diagram. Uh, immediately, immediately to the left is the soil pressure that you would determine from the active state of pressure. And you can see it would be zero at the top, and it uh, extends down to uh, a maximum at the base, as you would expect. Obviously, if you go with different soil types, uh, uh, the slope of this line is going to change accordingly to the angle of friction. Uh, then we can apply a surcharge here. This might be an embankment that we're going to put above our wall. And as you can see, uh, uh, the geotechnics would show that that would just simply be the K active component of that surcharge. Uh, finally, above that, we can introduce uh, surcharge. Line loads are shown in, on this slide. We could have point loads or even a, uh, a live load surcharge uh, uh, to account for traffic. For example, ASHTO recommends a 360 PSF surcharge to model um, live load traffic above that. You take the, sum of the summation of that and you get this design curve that's shown on the right that we're going to use uh, in the design. So coming from the top, that first reinforcement, we're going to go from the top of the structure down to the midpoint between levels one and two, and we're going to apply that lateral pressure to the fascia there. And, uh, and from that, we will determine what the reinforcement requirements are of that level. And then we continue and we can do that all the way down to the bottom, and it's a wonderful activity to, to do by hand. Uh, if you're going for your master's degree, uh, you'll get to do this by hand. But we'll use a computer program. Uh, this particular slide here, the program I'm using is uh, uh, MSEW by, by Adama, prepared by uh, Doug Lashinsky. Um, What's shown here is I have an example wall that's uh, going to be 12 foot high. Uh, I'm now going to place geogrid reinforcement at two foot intervals. So the base reinforcement there, I've got uh, eight inches above. That's uh, equal to what uh, the segmental retaining walls typically are. And I'm going to assume that the geogrid length here is 12 feet. This particular program allows us to use up to five different geogrid layers. So in the base, you can see I have a color here that's in purple. And that particular product, if you can read this slide, it's very difficult to see, but it's like 7,400 pounds per foot is the ultimate strength of that, overlain by a weaker material, 4,700 pounds per foot, which considering that a car weighs about 3,500 pounds, it gives you an indication of how much strength these materials have. So with that, we go ahead and we put in these different layers in there. And the backfill here, I'm saying it is all one material, and, but we could use multiple layers of material in this program. So with that, we can now run the program, uh, and if we can get a uh, determination of bearing capacity, uh, direct sliding, eccentricity, uh, uh, evaluate the strength of the geogrid versus the load is being placed. We can look at uh, the connection strength of the, the fascia unit, and we can also check out the pullout, pulling out here. And this table here, while it's quite difficult to read, is 
is uh, showing you all the different safety factors for those different models there. Uh, we're looking for, in this case, uh, a safety factor of about one, and in this particular example, we're far exceeding that. This next slide is, is showing uh, what the, the strength of the connection is, and we're looking at the uh, the load on the uh, on the geogrid, and it will tell us what the embedment uh, uh, is necessary to resist it. Uh, in this particular case, the worst case, the, uh, at, at the bottom we only need like basically a half a foot. Uh, at the top, it works out to be almost five and a half feet. So our geogrids are considerably longer than they need to be. Uh, so we would probably go down and say, we would take that top length up there, uh, go past the, the failure plane, and that would give us a total length of roughly six feet. We could now just make that uniform all the way down because uh, we're going to try to keep it simple out in the field. Uh, so we would just uh, use a single layer or uh, length of grid uh, and have those uh, lower levels uh, at the higher strength that we used in the design. So that, that pretty much takes care of internal stability. We now have to look at an uh, external stability, and there we're going to be looking at circular failures. Uh, here the world is homogeneous like it always is. Um, uh, we've got a re the reinforced wall there on the right. Uh, this program here is uh, Lashinsky's uh, uh, RESA, Reinforced Earth Slope Stability Analysis. Uh, we put in the, the geogrid layers. What's nice about uh, having both of these programs is you can just import the, the project geometry from the uh, Mechanically Stabilized Earth program directly into this, so all those grids are are already uh, set up for us. We can now set up what the shear strength is of the base soils, uh, and we can change them uh, to meet the actual conditions out in the field. So how this program works is circular failure. We don't know exactly where it's going to fail. We know it's going to have some radius point uh, up, in the, up in the sky. So the program does a search algorithm by evaluating an initiation point between the top and uh, X1 and X2 shown in uh, these boxes here will define what the uh, uh, X component of the, the arbitrary Cartesian uh, coordinate system that we developed. And then it also has from X3 to X4 the termination of those circles. So you can see in this graph here down in the lower left what the examples of those circles would be. So the analysis approach is basically it develops a circle from X1 to X3 and calculates in accordance with the modified Bishop approach what that safety factor would be. Uh, where where those circles are interrupted by the geogrid, the geogrid actually adds an additional force to the shear strength of that particular slice. So the program very quickly will calculate uh, quite a few uh, failure surfaces. This box here is showing you how many points between our initiation point, uh, our uh, initiation limits we'll be using the analysis. So in this example, I put in uh, 10 of them, and at the base I have 10 also. So we're basically looking at creating uh, a thousand circles here, and when you look at them all, they're all in black. Uh, so we're looking at quite a few potential failure surfaces. The program, you hit the run button and voila, about like, uh, half a minute later, will give you not only the lowest safety factor, which shown in this case is 1.5, but it gives you a range of similar circles, uh, uh, of uh, similar safety factors. So 
what's shown here in red are those safety factors that would be between 1.5 and 1.55. This gives us geotechnical engineers and a, a, a better understanding of what exactly what we would see in the field. We're not going to see as that specific circle. We're going to see some sort of band of failed materials. At the top, what's quite nice is that it, we can see we can check to see if we have bound our problem by doing our initiate our analysis to an ex sufficient extent such we're capturing what will be the lowest safety factors. And you can see that at the top where the, the lowest safety factor is bounded by um, uh, other data to the left and right, both at the initiation and at the termination. Uh, nice to, to note here, you'll, if you look by inspection very carefully that wherever there's a geogrid, our safety factors get quite high. And you'll find when you run these analyses that the bottom geogrids are pretty much going to push the, uh, the lowest safety factor to the right and deeper into the, uh, into the program, which gives us better stability. So now this is for a homogeneous uh, material. That's not quite realistic. So let me take you to a, a slide. Uh, of a, a project I recently consulted on. We had a 30-foot tall wall. Uh, the designer here, basically, we were filling 30 feet above some fine-grained soils. And you can see in this particular photograph, or in this slide, that the data was suggesting that the groundwater was depressed from uh, a higher elevation with, uh, within the site to a lower to the left. Uh, to the left was actually designated wetlands, so uh, what probably should have been considered was the groundwater very nearly at the surface uniform. Anyway, they, they ran their analyses, and it's an iterative process, and they, and they had a whole series of geogrids you can see here that extended quite far, roughly about 70 feet. And their target safety factor that they went with was 1.25. Uh, so off we we ran, went out. They went out and built that. And uh, about 11 months after construction, this this retaining wall started ripping itself apart. So what happened? Well, it turns out that the base of the the base of that wall is off fine grain materials. We're talking, uh, it, was, it was actually five layers of, uh, of fine grain materials ranging from low plasticity clays to high plasticity clays. And sure enough, while we load these soils with this embankment, we're going to put those soils in a state of total stress. So what's shown here is that that overall thickness there, we we're going to, we we're going to have basically excess pore pressure approximately reaching uh, 4,000 PSF. All right. The sad part is, is that it was going, it's going to take almost 207 days for those excess pore pressures to be dissipated, as shown here on this uh, scale to the, on the bottom. That means that these soils are going to be in a, uh, uh, a state of total stress for at least 165 days. Uh, also, what's uh, shown here is that we were going to be looking at almost two and a half feet of vertical deformation that uh, would have caused problems for the final uh, solution. Anyway, so what we did is we started building this structure in 10-foot intervals. And we, we start here, we have a safety factor of roughly, uh, let me see here, uh, 2.0 with the first 10-foot lift. Um, we put the next 10-foot on there, and the safety factor drops down to 1.18, and the last 10-foot sneaks below one, which means that we're expecting that by the time they finish this wall, this wall is going to start deforming. And sure enough, it, they didn't notice until they actually paved at the top, 
and then we started seeing uh, four inch wide tension cracks. So the, the uh, moral of that story is, is that you must consider not only total stress, but effect, uh, the, effect, the total stress and the effective stress states when we're loading up these soils as, as you would with any slope. So with that, I would thank you for your attention, and if, if uh, you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Okay, thank you for the excellent presentation. We are getting a little low on time. Uh, as I check to see if there's any additional questions, I do have a quick one. Um, the last case study that you showed resonated well with me because in Louisiana we have a lot of wetlands and soft clays. Could you just, um, if you have it on the top of your mind, a couple of other pitfalls that when I look at the design of these walls, you showed a lot of nice schematics from Professor Kerner and FHWA has design manuals and there's these programs. Where is the pitfalls in, in uh, construction, design and construction? Uh, excellent question. Uh, th there's a couple of manuals out there, the FHWA manual, there's the NCMA manual on the design of the segmental walls, and they're primarily focused on effective stress, and they don't really speak to the total stress condition. So, you know, as geotechnical engineers, we have to take a good evaluation as what what is the state of stress going to be, and we have to do our analysis accordingly, uh, just not blindly going with an effective stress or long-term analysis. So that's a large pitfall. Another pitfall is, is that these segmental retaining walls, uh, we're estimating that uh, three to five percent of them are falling down in the U.S., which is completely unacceptable. But why is this happening? It's kind of a commodity market, and we've got designers that are just looking at the internal stability, and they're saying that slope stability and bearing capacity and settlement is by others, and others hasn't, haven't been alerted to this fact. Uh, so some of these walls are falling down. So they're the biggest pitfalls that I have. Excellent. I really appreciate it, Jay. All right, so now we're going to move to our last presentation within this session. Uh, this presentation is by Professor Zekos, Ada Zekos. And I will let her have the floor. Thank you, Naveed. Um, hope everybody can hear me well. Um, and good morning to everyone. Um, it's um, a pleasure to uh, go after uh, three excellent presentations. I will be discussing uh, the performance of levees and try to touch upon a few different aspects uh, as it um, relates to levees, looking a little bit in the past and then also um, giving you um, a bit of a look into what we are uh, working on currently. As we all know, um, when it comes to levees, we can have um, many different types of failures. Uh, and failure modes. Um, and I think what makes it um, particularly challenging is that um, many times we end up having a combination of these failure modes, uh, which makes it a little bit harder to really understand, uh, design, or mitigate uh, appropriately. And not only that, but in addition to erosion, overtopping, um, seepage, piping, um, as we see here, or sometimes even slightly unexplained uh, failures, we can also um, see levees fail due to seismic events. And this has now happened um, in several occasions. I'm just showing two pictures uh, from two um, older events um, in 89 from Loma Prieta and then 95 um, in Kobe. But uh, when we look into the available guidelines that we have uh, in terms of levee design and evaluating existing uh, levee um, systems, we see that the majority of these guidelines, um, as expected, of course, refer to the construction and evaluation of levees under what I would call, just for the sake of this presentation, static conditions. Uh, really, I mean that from the perspective of the levee itself, uh, because clearly, um, you know, flow and overtopping and hurricane events are anything but static. And then when we try to find some guidelines uh, for a seismic evaluation, we see that really there is very uh, limited uh, resources available to engineers. 
Um, in terms of the top part of the slides, um, I'm not in any way implying that this is a completely comprehensive list, but these are some of the main guidelines that people would turn to when trying to evaluating these um, systems. Now, uh, what I will do for this presentation is highlight some uh, key features and failure modes of levies as they were uh, further highlighted in case studies in New Orleans. Um, I was personally involved in the investigation of these levy failures, and so it's a little bit um, easier to, to do it using uh, some of these case studies. But as you will see, um, they are very representative of um, failure modes and features that we will find in any similar uh, system. And then I will go into more detail on the seismic response and specifically describing a simplified procedure that we have developed for assessing the vulnerability of these systems under seismic scenarios. And finally, um, end with presenting some uh, ongoing work that we have um, that focuses on health monitoring and inspection of levy systems. So um, some lessons that we either learned or really relearned in some occasions um, by looking back all the way to 2005, now 14 years ago, is that when it comes to overtopping and erosion, we can actually design levees to withstand significant overtopping that lasts for actually quite some time. However, the emphasis is on well-compacted uh, clay materials and not sandy materials, as is the case on the left picture, where um, a levee um, has been completely eroded away uh, due to um, severe um, wave action. As we see on the right, we have a levee uh, that has withstand the same level of overtopping, and the main difference between these two sites was the type of materials used for the construction of the levees. Further on, uh, what we can uh, make sure to highlight in all cases is, as I mentioned at the beginning, pay attention to all possible failure modes, especially when it comes to under seepage, through seepage, piping problems, uh, toe erosion. Uh, it's very, very um, important that we highlight all of these as they are relate to each individual site so that then the measures that we come up with in terms of mitigating or when newly constructing a system addresses all of them uh, and not just um, some of them. It is also very important for sites where there used to be systems to take full advantage of any past observations or history of similar types of failures um, so that we can uh, use them accordingly. These systems um, are very, very complex and interconnected. This is something that I think really boomed after uh, the 2005 uh, levy failures in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and it's been uh, really good to see the emphasis that has been given in both the research community but also in the industry on trying to evaluate these and design them as systems. And the importance there is that because they are so spatially distributed, uh, they are bound to have transitions and connections with other parts of infrastructure, and therefore we really need to understand how this interaction will happen during the disaster, the natural disaster, whether that be a hurricane or, of course, an earthquake or any other natural disaster, and um, make sure that all the pieces work together, uh, and also that we can identify the, the agency, um, that is in charge so that these transitions can happen in the best possible way. Continuing on and really building on what has um, been presented by the previous speakers, it's also really important to understand that um, geology matters when studying sites. It's very important to have very clear communication between uh, those who do field testing, lab testing, and those who are doing the analysis back at the office and of course, always providing an independent uh, review for each project so that we can um, just catch any mistakes or oversights that may have been um, inadvertently made. Uh, what we see here in the pictures is the failure in the 17th Street Canal um, and um, the infamous now picture of the helicopter trying to close off um, the levee break. Um, this was a site, for example, that uh, I think serves as a good case study to really demonstrate that upon good understanding of the geology conditions, 
uh, a detailed subsurface characterization through detailed uh, field testing, and further on more uh, laboratory uh, testing, high quality laboratory testing uh, that uh, can all come together to give a very complete picture of what the site conditions are like. And what the point really here being that if we are able to collect all that and put everything together, we do have the tools uh, that with the um, correct input will give us very good insight into what this um, behavior is going to be. What we see in this video is of the London Avenue Canal, the north failure where the west side of the levee failed, whereas the east side uh, uh, simply started, was basically on the verge of failing, but really got saved by the failure of the uh, side um, in the op on the opposite bank. And what really this shows is that, as I mentioned before, we have the tools that given the uh, correct information about soil properties and subsurface characterization, can really capture um, what happened in the field. And so this really gives us um, confidence in the tools that we have available to us. And this was, this is just one of the examples, but this was the case with both simpler methods like a limit equilibrium analysis method or the more um, sophisticated, if I may, um, finite element um, methods. And so it's really important um, you know, to understand that, yes, the analysis will work, but it has to be done carefully and well, of course, and with the appropriate input parameters. And of course, in environments that are very highly variable, such like riverine and deltaic environments, where we typically um, find levee systems, it is really important to allow for an adequate margin of error and uncertainty um, in uh, deciding the factors of safety or the level of performance that we want to expect out of this system. Now, finally, for this part of the presentation, I think it's always important to highlight that it's very, very important um, that these systems are maintained and that access is available for the maintenance and the inspection of these systems. And for this point, I have um, chosen these two pictures and um, they are both from the 17th Street, um, Street Canal in New Orleans. And one uh, shows uh, the west side and one shows the east side. And you can see the difference in terms of where you have the space to have a very nice access road at the crest of the levee, the toe of the levee is unobstructed, and any residencies or private property is uh, beyond uh, the street. Whereas on the picture to the left, you see that there are fences, private properties, swimming pools, buildings that are essentially all the way up at the toe of the levee, making it very, very difficult for the levee to be inspected and maintained and really for any problematic points to be picked up early so that action uh, can happen before um, a significant failure is observed. Now, as I mentioned, this was kind of focusing more on the levee as a static uh, with uh, the load being flooding, uh, river flow, a hurricane, and that type of natural disaster. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, there is a need for seismic uh, response guidance. Um, levees are threatened by seismic loading. I have here the example of um, the system in California, which consists of thousands of miles of levees. And one that is very critical, since um, I think all of us can appreciate the importance of the delta and how it could affect possibly the water source for uh, tens of millions uh, of people in the event of an earthquake and, um, and uh, failures in this levee system. And I think if we look at river cities and how, what the flood protection level is uh, from an older study from the, Sanford, from the Sacramento Flood um, Control Agency, uh, it's really important to see that Sacramento, for example, which is a seismically active river city, has a much lower level of protection compared to some other uh, cities pictured here. Now, many can argue, and they would be right to do so, that there is even uncertainty as to whether these flood protection levels are um, true um, and uh, whether they represent um, the, the actual conditions of the system, given that at the time of the survey, the systems had not really been evaluated as a whole. Needless to say, however, I think this further highlights the need for a better way to evaluate the seismic response of levees, which brings me to the second part of the presentation, where I would go in some uh, detail 
on the methodology that we have developed. Um, it is a simplified methodology. However, it captures the two-dimensional dynamic response of levies, which for um, reasons that I will show on in the next slide, I believe to be uh, fairly critical in understanding uh, how they will perform under a seismic event. Um, these are the steps, and uh, I won't spend more time here, but rather go through the steps one by one. Um, since this was targeting uh, the state of California, uh, the cross-sections that were selected were representative of some major areas in California. However, I will say that if you look at the bottom uh, where we show the shear wave velocity profiles of these uh, sites, you will find that between the three of them, they capture a really large range of conditions that you will find in other um, areas as well. And of course, after selecting um, the cross sections and what your geometry and your subsurface conditions are, will look like, the next important step is characterizing your seismic sources, which is quite an ask um, for uh, an area such as um, the Delta in California and, and really uh, all of the, the Bay Area. And so in doing that, um, you see we followed these steps here. Uh, where we conclude with a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis in a deaggregation. And so what that looks like uh, for this area is that if we select to go with a 200-year return period, which was the consensus, at least at the time, uh, of what would be appropriate for these systems, what you would get is that you would be um, at a peak ground acceleration of 0.17 G. And then, of course, deaggregate that to understand where uh, this uh, comes from uh, in terms of events, and you see the details basically at the top of the slide, magnitudes uh, that range from five and a half to seven, uh, and events coming from distances both close and uh, further away uh, up at 80 kilometers, which means that this can end up being a little bit problematic now if we were really hoping that this would be controlled by one event that then we would run ground motions for. We clearly see here that this is not the case. And so what we end up doing is we have to select a very wide range of ground motions to be able to capture uh, all the characteristics. Um, and the details are given here and there's no, oops, sorry, and there's no need to go through uh, all of them step by step. But really what is important to highlight is that I think for some reason this is stuck, I think, for – I apologize. I'm not sure. It's not a very heavy animation. It's just text. Okay, I'm not sure. Otto, I see some bullets popping up. Is that the animation? Yeah, my, my screen, I apologize, everyone. My screen is uh, frozen, so I will try to um, quickly reload this um, site. Um, and um, hopefully, okay, here we go. Okay, so I will move on to the next slide, and I'll try this one again. But essentially, my point is, if hopefully everybody still sees the slide, that we had hundreds of motions that were used for each of the um, cross-sections that I showed before. And so, okay, I'm not sure. All right, is there a way that um, someone from the control can help me with What do you need help with, Ada? Sorry, I'm not seeing the change in the slides. If you can see it, then I can proceed. But for me, my screen is frozen on the slide 21 preview, and it's not advancing. Okay. I see for slide 22, uh, which is you, you, Oh, you do see forward. slide 22? OK. Um, so then the problem is on, on my end. Um, OK. So um, want, is I can there, put is it, slides for you. 
it, it, if, if that's okay, yes, because I don't want to take any more time now here. Um, in, in looking at slide 22, basically what you will see uh, is the input parameters that were needed for our analysis. We used uh, the Quad 4M 2D uh, program um, that is a two-dimensional finite element uh, program analysis, and you see that for your input, uh, you would use uh, basically your geometry and your ground motion. And then the important thing is that as an output, you can get um, shear stress um, time histories. You can get acceleration time histories for every node. And you can also get a horizontal equivalent acceleration uh, time history for selected sliding surfaces, which will be important for our seismic um, slope stability evaluation. And so in the next slide, um, 23, we will see basically that um, the approach then is to characterize um, the layer that we think might liquefy in a specific cross-section. And then what we can get is we can get the shear stress time history for points in that layer that we can directly use to calculate the cyclic stress ratio uh, compared to the more simplified approach that we would normally take um, using just um, a, a value of the peak ground acceleration. And then in slide 24, uh, we can also do a similar thing where we can pre-select uh, sliding surfaces to represent shallower slides and deeper slides. And for those, ask the program to compute the horizontal equivalent acceleration uh, that we will use later on. Uh, in the next slide 25, what we can see is that finally the vulnerability of these systems is either tied to a layer liquefying, leading therefore to failure, or having significant seismic slope displacements, which again would be unacceptable given the loss of freeboard um, that this would result in. So then if we go into um, the details, um, we can see in slide 26, for example, uh, which is an animated slide. So if you don't mind Naveed clicking through the animation, but what we see here is that because we have a two dimensional um, image of the levy in our analysis, we can get profiles of the cyclic stress ratio for different locations. So for example, at the free, um, free field condition, at the toes of the levee, and also at the crest of the levee. And then what this allows us to do, if we go on to slide 27, is create this 2D image of how the CSR changes for different levels of seismic um, of shaking intensity. This example is for a 0.2 G, but we have those for different levels. And this highlights a very important thing that um, the CSR is much higher under the toe of the levee because of the initial shear stress that exists there compared to the crest location. And I say that this is important because up to some time, um, because of limited time and resources, when we were running a CSR liquefaction type analysis for levees, we would typically go and do that right under the crest of the levee, which is most likely where we would have information from boreholes. And what we see here is that this would be an unconservative approach because the CSR is actually the smallest there. And so if we move on to slide 28, what we see is how we can use this process. So this procedure basically has these CSR curves that we can use, and then if we click through this animation, um, we can uh, progress and find uh, at the depth of our liquefiable layer what the expected CSR is based on the process, and then we can use any triggering uh, relationship that we want and find basically for the um, either SPT blow count of that layer or the CPT um, tip resistance for that layer, what the likelihood of liquefaction would be. Um, so fairly quickly and simply, however, knowing that we have accounted for a two-dimensional dynamic response of this levy. And then moving on to slide 29, we can see how we can use um, the results of our analysis to also look at seismic slope displacement. And so again, moving through the animations in this slide, we can do an equivalent Newmark type displacement analysis where through the uh, equivalent horizontal acceleration of this layer, use that to compute the um, cumulative displacements for each sliding surface. And then in slide 30, be able to present information in two different ways. One is to show the seismic demand through the K-max ratio, which is something no, known in the seismic uh, slope displacement um, evaluation. 
we see uh, quite a variation there, which I do want to just take a second to comment is to be expected because levees, unlike most slopes that we have um, methods developed for, are short um, and fairly stiff compared um, to uh, the mean period of most ground motions. And so this creates an added variability uh, in the response, which is again important to see and had not been shown up to this point and demonstrates that some of the existing methods uh, that are applicable to slopes may not be applicable to systems like levees. And then finally moving on to slide 31, we can see the, um, the, all the results put together. On the left, we see the uh, unnormalized, basically just displacement versus what is known as the KY over Kmax ratio, which really all that it is is uh, the ratio of the capacity of the levee versus the demand that comes from the earthquake. Um, it's a way that um, these types of results have been presented since the 70s. And what we can also see on the right is basically the normalized version of this plot. Um, for this case, for levees, the best way to normalize is through the peak ground velocity. After studying this, we were able to find that this was the best uh, uh, parameter to use. And we see that the results, for most part, fall on a straight line that, again, can be used um, if we move on to slide 32 to predict, basically, behavior. And so, really, what it all kind of comes down to, as we've seen slide 32, is that the ability, basically, again, fairly quickly, um, if you kind of trace back the steps of this process, um, be able to determine which category you're at. What is the level of displacement you would expect, and what are those considered for a levy system? Are they considered acceptable, are they unacceptable, or are they in that middle um, yellow category? Now, um, this kind of summarizes the simplified procedure that I mentioned. Um, and however, we need to keep in mind, if we move on to slide 33, that there are many other things that we need to consider, um, and more increasingly so, unfortunately, as years go by. So one of those, for example, is how will the conditions that we have been assuming for our analysis change, given um, climate change, um, the increase of the water table and other considerations. And so I think this brings me nicely to the final part of the presentation, which will discuss some ongoing work that we have focusing on health monitoring now uh, and um, health and inspection basically, and how we can improve upon that given the spatial distribution of these systems. Uh, I think everyone from the Army Corps of Engineers to private um, companies to researchers understand that it is almost impossible to continue to spend the resources to have people uh, walk or drive through these uh, levees constantly to be able to, um, to do this um, type of inspection. And so given the advances in technology, we have been looking at uh, how we can collect, um, we are collecting optical images so that we can create um, 3D point cloud models, which is uh, what the video on the right hopefully is um, showing, uh, which is basically a section of a levee um, that we uh, flew a drone over, collected images, and made this model. And of course, the advantage of this is that now what we're seeing is not a picture. It's a model whose points have three coordinates, which means that I can very quickly cut cross sections through, sections that I can use for limit equilibrium analysis, for finite element analysis. Um, and also, uh, these point clouds can be used for identifying any other features that I may find I need uh, once I can train this algorithm to understand and, and pick them up. In the next slide, what you can see in slide 35 um, is what we have done in our own lab for a smaller scale levy, where we now combine, we take it a step further and we combine the optical camera results with the thermal camera results. And so if you go through the animation to show both lines, um, both series of pictures, we can see at the top the thermal, and then at the bottom the optical image, and uh, we can see how nicely the two can complement each other, and we can have a fusion, if you wish, of these methods to give us an even better understanding. And um, given that I know people also like to see how this applies to field conditions, not just controlled lab conditions, in my second to last slide, 36, 
you can see how we have applied a similar technique in a site um, here in Michigan. Uh, in the levee site where you see one of our U of M graduate students, Cassie Champagne, flying uh, our big drone, uh, it's outfitted with an optical and a thermal camera. It collects um, images. We can create our 3D point cloud model and then uh, overlay uh, the thermal camera results and identify, for example, an existing failure, um, as you see pointed out by the two red boxes. And so um, I think that this technique has um, a lot to give us. Um, there's definitely challenges to address um, as they relate to sites with um, a lot of vegetation, for example, um, or uh, perhaps um, some limited access of either flying the drone or even driving a vehicle with cameras mounted on it. But I think there is a lot of promise here where we can have a, a semi-automated at this point way of inspecting and monitoring miles and miles of levees so that we can only then use inspectors for select sites where um, the, our results pinpoint that there might be uh, a problem or raise a flag rather than having them just go through and do it um, for, for every single section uh, of levee. And so with that, I will uh, finish off with my last slide. Thank you. Um, give you my email for anybody who wants to follow up with any additional questions or requests. And again, I want to apologize for the slightly technical problems, but hopefully uh, we were able to do this with Naveed's help. Ada, thank you. We, I, I did keep up with all the animations and the slide changes, so I think we are um, excellent. Thank you very much. So. Um, with this, uh, looking to see if there's any questions. I, I do have for uh, just one question. I, I think it's actually quite fitting as we conclude this web conference. We started with Dr. Thomas Oman on remote sensing, and we finished with Ada on levees, but also, in a sense, remote sensing, and in this case, using manned aerial to document uh, our infrastructure embankment dams and slopes. So I think this is quite a nice fitting for our session. I really appreciate that, Ada. Sure. Um, recordings of today's presentations will be available on YouTube. Um, you can obtain a PDF of the slides from the specific speakers. And so I'm going to go back and uh, just run through the speakers again. You can email me myself and I will try to um, obtain the, the PDFs and send it out. Um, also, you can directly contact the specific uh, presenters, Dr. Oman, Dr. Matasevich, um, Jay McKelvey, and also Dr. Ada Zekos. Uh, finally, I want to thank our speakers for their presentations and our gold sponsor, Keller, for supporting the Embankment, Embankment Dams and Slopes web conferences uh, this week. Thank you for attending our web conferences. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect and enjoy the rest of your day.